One thing is abundantly clear, absolute. There is no getting to the other side of this fiscal chasm without coming to a common understanding of what a sustainable rate of health spending looks like for this nation and quantifying it and setting measures against which we can track national performance. And we're especially thankful to RWJ and to Brookings for their support of today's symposium. The phenomenon of skyrocketing medical costs is not terribly new. As you all know, since 1970, healthcare costs per capita have grown about 2.4 percentage points faster than GDP. The health sector has been one of the bright spots on the job creation front. And for a wealthy nation, shouldn't health be one of our top spending priorities? We hope to delve deeper into an issue that is so important that the Altarium Institute put it in the title of its healthcare center. The debt held by the public, not counting uh, the debt held by uh, the government itself, uh, is now over 70 percent um, of, uh, of GDP and rising. So why is the budget outlook uh, so unsustainable? Well, uh, because federal spending is projected to grow faster than the GDP, and that's due to the aging of the population and the projected cost of health care. It's not due to any of the things that they're arguing about in the campaign. All the serious bipartisan efforts uh, to stabilize the debt come out at the same place. Uh, stabilizing the debt from where we are now will take reducing the growth of health care spending and increasing revenues because nobody thinks we can uh, get the spending down uh, fast enough uh, not to need uh, more revenues, and revenues are extraordinarily low at the moment. And the evidence of waste and inefficiency, as well as poor quality in the system, uh, is, uh, is all around us, uh, and especially in uh, fee-for-service Medicare. Anyway, nothing's easy. Thank you. Uh, you know, if you're in a fiscal hole and you want to get out of it, you have to stop digging. If you just uh, look at the share of the budget uh, that is accounted for by uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and other health spending, and that, in that includes the subsidies in the health insurance exchanges, uh, that share rises uh, from 24% uh, in 2012 to about 35% in 2022. Uh, we have yet, either in the Affordable Care Act or in any other legislation, really think about the long-term impact in legislative terms, as opposed to in important conferences like this one, uh, the long-term impact of Medicare spending on future generations. How do you solve what's essentially a lack of revenues by spending cuts where we have spending under reasonable control? I'm somewhat concerned about whether or not we ought not to be talking about cultural changes and that we ought to have a debate. I mean, we spend billions of dollars on what some people consider to be of no value. What the real world is, in my view, managing uncertain progress. It has to do with health care costs and premiums growing faster than income. That's what this is all about. And so my point is we are squandering two times as much as is required to cover the uninsured because we can't figure out a bipartisan way to get our fiscal house in order. And in my view, that's a moral failing of a very high order. So let's just be clear. Tax cuts are a major part of how we got in this mess. If we don't engage the patient both in terms of cost sharing through the, through the wellness, smart benefit design, as well as decision support, they have to have tools to enable them to help make decisions with the clinicians, properly incentivize physicians, properly incentivize patients. Those communities that figure it out will get the jobs. That ain't rocket science either. Jobs are going to go where healthcare costs are lower. Per a point that uh, Joe Newhouse has made uh, very, very articulately, the challenge is not simply uh, reducing per capita spending in the U.S., but every year uh, reducing it. Uh, uh, by a little bit. It, Warren Buffett referred to, you know, healthcare spending growth in excess of GDP as, uh, as the tapeworm inside the American economy, and I, I agree with him. It's, it's not, uh, not only for the, its impact the federal, on the federal budget, but also its impact on, on both uh, American workers and, and private employers. Uh, will we get to a situation where value-based payments, whether it's in the form of bundled payments or shared savings, you fill in the blank, considerably exceed 
10% of total revenues to American doctors and hospitals. It's inconceivable to me that anybody would go through the pain of re-engineering their clinical processes unless a very big share of their revenue, whether it's from the government or government funding or private sector funding, was, uh, was value, very intensely uh, value, value sensitive. Should we just blow up you know, employer-sponsored health insurance, take away the, <laughs> the tax advantage? Good or bad in American healthcare, we have it somewhere. <laughs> we also know that we have to reduce our cost structure, and we also know uh, that, that we have to, to look at appropriateness of, of medical care around the country, the, the non-sustainable rate of uh, MRIs and high contrast CTs are not only a cost challenge, but we kill people every year in this country with radiation uh, causing leukemias and, and uh, uh, other radiation hazards. The, the comments earlier about comparative research are great, but, but we don't need a whole lot more research. Well, I should not say it like this. We do need a lot more research, but we are not acting on what we already know. When we talk about all these experiments, value-based systems, all these things we're going to do in the future with an open-ended system, whether that can work without the budget constraint that, Zed, you mentioned that Intermountain Health was self-enforcing. The first thing we set out to do was to measure health spending and prices and utilization and employment on a more timely basis so we could be tracking more immediately what's really happening with spending. This um, presentation is going to be much more about what would be a sustainable rate of increase in spending rather than how would we get there. And I want to focus in on GDP plus zero because that's such a sort of a ground zero uh, scenario to look at. An employer who has low wage workers is still going to see spending going up faster than wages. So. So what Charlie's doing here and what his framework tries to do, which is I think is a good idea, is to say, okay, let's actually take this problem, let's impose on it some budget constraints and some political economic constraints about how much can actually be afforded by the government and how much are people going to be willing to spend. And then let's draw inferences from that about how much room there is for federal health spending. And the reason for that is basically that economists are actually quite humble about how we use our money, right? And so if you just view it as a pure economic problem, it's, you know, well, whatever people want. And over time, we may want to spend more and more on health, right? You know, who knows? Maybe several centuries from now, we'll spend 90% of GDP on health because that's what we do because, you know, we've got enough stuff. So aspirationally, we're going to get up to 20.5% on a persistent level in order to have sustainable uh, health care spending growing at basically GDP. Uh, that's going to require deep fundamental tax reform. All the assumptions this morning, I mean, if you were going to get to a sustainable level of spending, it does require Congress to actually agree on something. And I don't think um, that's going to happen tomorrow. So that sort of brings us to what's happening in the real world outside of Washington. What are doctors, insurers, hospitals, patients beginning to do? While I think no one wants to say a lot about this in public, the risk of employer exit is a very serious risk. So are purchasers, my companies, on a sustainable path, just to mirror the conversation of the morning? I would just say no, period. They don't think they are. They're not acting as if they are. They're contemplating much more dramatic changes in their programs than they did three, four, five years ago. These are all capitalists. They like the idea of incenting consumer behavior to seek, as Arnie has described it, the high-performing providers, the low-fuel-using providers. The employers want to play that role. They want to retain that function but they're feeling that they may not be able to sustain it. So in terms of the policy implications for this uh, somewhat bleak story, our members feel health reform has to actually address medical costs, not just government expenditures. It's very, very curious that if you think back to health reform, there was very specifically focused on the numbers of people who didn't have coverage and the expectation that any policy would have to bring two-thirds, three-quarters in, right? Everybody talked about that as a goal. We do not have a similar goal with respect to health care costs. We've been doing a great deal of work looking at different communities, and you can see a very strong correlation between rates of increase in health care costs and consolidation. There's no doubt out about it. We strongly support the goal of bringing people into the system, but it will not be able to be sustained unless there's affordability. We're budget people, mm -hmm. most of us, mm -hmm. but yeah, he's, he's a doctor, mm -hmm. he's a provider, and we all know we can't get anywhere unless the provider community right. and the doctors and nurses are really behind it. But I walk in, my name is Tom, I'm an economist, ask me how to cut cost by cutting employment and cutting your wages.
Altarum Institute, a nonprofit health systems research and consulting organization working to improve health and health care. Altarum Institute, systems research for better health. 1-800-273-8255.